Thank you, Simon, for reading and for those thoughts about the protesters. And welcome to our third and final talk in this little series, uh, Wolves in Shepherd's Clothing, Whom Will You Follow? And you'll see the three characters we've been studying at the very beginning of chapter 10. Truly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Jesus uses this parable of, of sheep farming to ask us the question, um, whom will you follow? And we've looked at it from three different perspectives, three different characters in the story. Um, in the first week, two weeks ago, you can find the, the talk on the website for free. We looked at the alternative to Jesus as a shepherd. He warns us, all who came before me were thieves and robbers. In other words, there are those in this world offering us spiritual leadership who actually aren't serving us at all. They're serving themselves. And they are there, he says, to kill and to destroy. And Jesus wants to warn us about some of the alternatives. Um, and I guess that's fairly uncontroversial to, to say that in the world there are some rogue leaders, some rogue governments, some rogue dictators. That's uncontroversial. But Jesus makes it more controversial when he says, all who came before me are these things. Every alternative, ultimate ruler to Jesus, he wants to warn us, is a thief and a robber. Then last week we looked at the sheep. Um, how does someone become a follower of Jesus? Is it by blind faith taking a leap in the dark? And actually we saw last week it was the exact opposite of blind faith. It was seeing faith. And we looked at the example of this man in chapter 9 who has his blind eyes open physically. And on the basis of, of that evidence comes to conclude that Jesus is a king worth following. Well we say the best till last. Today this final talk we're looking at Jesus the shepherd himself, the good shepherd himself. You see the little outline um, in the middle of the, the service sheets. Please um, open that if that would help you as we go through together. When you consider who to back, who to follow, I guess most of us have two criterion in our minds. Uh, first, we want to know what this particular leader stands for and what is their manifesto. What is their objective? If we were to vote them into office, what would they do with that power? That's why before uh, the last election, we had promises and election promises and manifestos setting out the stall of what these leaders at least said that they would do if we backed them. We need to know their manifesto. But secondly, we want to know whether they have the integrity to follow it through. Um, you can have a manifesto that said we want everyone in the country to be a millionaire and hospitals to be emptied and everyone to be well, but no one would vote for you because they would think that you were lying and that you hadn't got the wherewithal to pull it off. We want to know what their objective is, but also whether they have the integrity, the commitment to follow it through. And I think that those two criteria are the very ones by which Jesus wants us to assess him as our leader. His objective, his manifesto, and his integrity and ability to pull it off. Uh, firstly, his, his objective, his manifesto, what does Jesus intend for you if you were to follow him as your shepherd? And just before we look at the answer in the Bible, I wonder what thoughts instinctively run through your mind. If I were to put my life in Jesus' hands, what would he want to do with it? What would be his plan for my life? And I suspect that the wrong answer to that question is one of the biggest reasons in our world why people don't follow Jesus. Uh, we, we might say, and it's popular to say, we don't follow Jesus because there's no evidence, it's all just um, supernatural um, fairy tales. But we've seen again and again over the last weeks that that's completely untrue. There's plenty of evidence of history. Um, for Jesus being exactly who he says. But I wonder whether for, for many people in our society, maybe for people here today, it's not ultimately the question of evidence that stops us. Just speaking autobiographically for a moment, it wasn't the question of evidence that stopped me. My first year at university, I've said um, in the last couple of talks, I, I looked into the Christian faith and some of the eyewitness evidence for it. I found it very compelling, but I didn't want to believe it. I thought it was probably true, if you ask me objectively. 
But I had a vested interest in not becoming a Christian because I thought that if I put my life in Jesus' hands, he would ruin it. He would make me less human, less free, less myself, um, less enjoyable. Uh, My view of Jesus was that somehow his intention for me was to make me, I don't know, a monk or an ascetic or somebody boring and dull and imprisoned um, and lifeless. And it's important to see that that is not what Jesus says his intention is. Look down at verse 10. The thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. What is Jesus' um, expressed purpose for you if you become one of his sheep? That you may have abundant life. Uh, And in the paragraph that, that accompanies this verse, Jesus explains what that life means. It means safety. So when the wolf comes or the, um, when the threat comes and the hired hand at that point, you know, he's, he's being paid by the hour for shepherding and um, it, it's worth his time to take the sheep out to the pasture and take them back again. But as soon as there's danger, well, that's not in the contract. And so he, he walks off the job. But Jesus says as the good shepherd that he stands by us even in the place of danger. It means safety. But also it means blessing. Jesus speaks of entering through him and finding pasture, which, if you can imagine yourself into the the mindset of a sheep for a moment, to enter into this metaphor fully, those are the two things you care about most, aren't they? You don't want wolves, they're they're bad, and you want lush grass, and that's good. And and what Jesus is saying to us, using this metaphor, is I will take away from you that which ultimately threatens you, and I will give to you that which ultimately is for your good. Um, I'll deliver you from evil, and I'll bring you into a place of blessing. And in these words, Jesus is echoing probably the most famous of the Old Testament songs, um, Psalm 23. Let me read to you again, just to remind you. The Lord is my shepherd, writes David, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. That's blessing. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in ways of righteousness for his name's sake. Blessing. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil protection, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Blessing. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Blessing. And that Old Testament expectation is exactly what Jesus echoes here when he says, if you follow me as your shepherd, my manifesto for you is life. I will deliver you from that which is evil, which ultimately would ruin and destroy you. And I will lead you into a place of green pastures, which ultimately is for your good. Now that's all very reassuring, but I have to say to you, I didn't believe that um, as a non-Christian. Jesus was offering me life, but I thought, no, still you're going to steal away my my fun and my joy and enslave me and make me into a monastic kind of lifeless person. I didn't believe him. And the thing that clinched it for me wasn't the manifesto, but it was what Jesus went on to say and to do to show that he um, put his life where his words were. Verse 11. I am the good shepherd... The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. See, Jesus says that he's come to bring for us life rather than death. And in order to give it to us, he will choose death rather than life. In order to win for me this green pasture, this safety, this deliverance from what would destroy me, Jesus is prepared to give up his life, to lay down his life, to go to the cross and to die. And John's gospel has been full of this truth. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. God gave his son from heaven to be born as a man to die, so that if we trust in him, we might not die, 
but might live. Um, Jesus describes himself in chapter 6 as the, the bread of life. This bread is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. I choose death, I'll give my flesh, um, and you can have life as a result. And what Jesus is describing in this rather gruesome picture is a death that, that he will die as payment for the sins that would take us away from life to death. Um, the Bible says that all of us have fallen short of God's standards. All of us in our hearts have evil things of which we're ashamed and at which God is angry. And for those things we deserve to die. But Jesus was the good shepherd. He lived a perfect life. He'd never done anything of which he was ashamed. In his heart he had no evil at which God should be angry. And he deserved to live. But Jesus, as the good shepherd, says that he is choosing to swap places with us. The innocent one will swap places with the guilty and will take upon himself the sentence that we deserve from a righteous judge because of our evil deeds. Death. And by his death, he will bring for us life. Just look again at verse 10 and 11 together. I am the good shepherd. I've come um, that they may have life and they may have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd laid down his life for the sheep. And I have to say, I was slow to realise the logic of this, but this was finally the thing that clinched it for me. It wasn't the evidence. I had to look into the evidence. I didn't want to make a decision with blind faith, but I found it checked out pretty well. Um, but the, the final point came for me, sitting in my room one day in Cambridge and thinking about, if I put my life in Jesus' hands, would he destroy it? Is his intention for me only harm and misery and religiousness? And the bit of logic that finally sunk in was, he must love me. He must intend my good if he is, is willing to pay a price as, as costly as his own life to procure it for me. This is the ultimate demonstration that Jesus is not like the thief and the robber. He is not in it for himself. He is not in, in it only for what he can get out of the sheep, you know, more bums on, on pews in, in churches so that he feels a bit better about his, his favourite institution, the Church of England, or whatever I used to think. Uh, no, Jesus must intend something more than that if he is prepared to give his life for it. He must intend for me what is, what is good. But there's more that this passage tells us about this. I, I think that the, the thing that I was most suspicious of in following Jesus was simply the loss of autonomy. It wasn't that I was following someone else. I, I didn't need any convincing that there were thieves and robbers in the world. I suppose all of us know that. All of us have led, followed people who've let us down and hurt us. Uh, we don't need Jesus to warn us about that. But as an alternative to being let down by people, most of us decide, in that case, I'll trust nobody. I'll just make all the decisions myself. Can't trust the politicians, can't trust the bankers, can't trust the protesters. There's lots of distrust, isn't there, out there on the steps of, of St Paul's. I can't trust anyone, so I'll only trust myself. And that seems to be the safest option. And Jesus is asking for us, give up your autonomy, give up trusting yourself and trust me. And I think, I just was reflecting on this, and in our society, I think increasingly there is, there is nowhere that we are willing to give up that autonomy. It used to be the case that you gave it up in marriage. You got married to somebody, it was a, it was a legally binding contract, but now that's under challenge with um, talk of prenuptial agreements. Let's make the, the agreement slightly less legally binding and work out how much each of us will get if there's a divorce. Um, it used to be that you shared bank accounts when you were married. As a matter of course, now increasingly people have separate bank accounts. It used to be that you'd make decisions together if you were married, but now increasingly people make decisions absolutely separately. What brought that home to me most of all was the, the hoo-ha about John Burko and his wife and um, he was the speaker of the House of Commons, is the speaker of the House of Commons, and she wanted to appear on reality TV, which is very embarrassing for him. But very much the tone that came across in the interviews was, well, she's her own woman, she must make her own decision. We're, we were basically independent in our career choices. I chose to be the speaker, she chooses to be on Big Brother, that must be her choice. And so even in marriage, there is independence now. And in religion, we want the same independence. Um, yes, Jesus, you can be one of the things I'm interested in sometimes, but to ask me to put my life into your hands, 
It was that loss of autonomy I didn't want. But I want to take us into the passage again for a third observation. I'm afraid I didn't have this in time for the, for the handout. Which is that life does not consist in independence or autonomy. But life consists in relationship of love and trust and obedience. Jesus says in verse 10, I've come to give them life. And later in John's Gospel, he will spell out exactly what that life means. In chapter 17, verse 3, he says, This is eternal life, to know you, the only God, and Jesus Christ that you've sent. Real life is not life lived as a, an independent, but life lived in relationship with the Father. And wonderfully, I realised that, that even Jesus laying down his life for the sheep demonstrates that relationship also. Just look at verse 17. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me. I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. Um, Jesus lays down his life that he might die, that we might live. But Jesus also lays down his life out of his desire to honour the Father who sent him. God the Father in heaven sent his Son to earth with the intention that he should die. And Jesus says here, this is not a relationship of coercion. It's not that God the Father is forcing me against my will. I lay down my life of my own authority. I choose to do this. So it's not that God the Father is some tyrant who imposes his will on Jesus, but neither is it the case that Jesus is an independent who delights in his autonomy from God. No, he says, um, I delight to lay down my, my life and I have authority to lay, take it up again, this charge I have received from my Father. Jesus chooses to do what somebody else that he trusts wants, what his Father wants. And the Father loves him because of what he does. For this reason, the Father loves me because. And Jesus, this was the thing that I just realised finally this morning. Jesus is inviting us into the same kind of relationship that he enjoys with the Father. Look at verse 14. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as, just as, I know the, the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. So is it the case that following Jesus means a loss of your autonomy? Yes, it, it does. Uh, will there be things that Jesus asks us to give up in our lives if we follow him? Yes, there are. Um, could it mean for some people in the world today, hearing a talk like this one, that if they follow Jesus, they might lose their very life in martyrdom? Yes, Jesus is quite realistic about that possibility. But is that loss of autonomy and putting your life in someone else's hands a bad thing? Does it make it less you? Is it life-denying? No. No, to be able to trust somebody with your life, even to be able to give up your life because of your devotion to their cause and for to have them delight in you, well, that is the essence of life. Jesus says to us, he's come to give us life. Green pastures and blessing. Deliverance from evil, security from that which would destroy us. He tells us that he is willing to give up his own life. He is willing to die that we might live. And then Jesus tells us that this life that he dies to bring us, well, it may be a loss of autonomy, but to trust somebody enough to put your life in their hands, to know their love for you enough that you're absolutely secure in the path that they choose for you, well, that's the very essence of the life of God. It's the life of the Trinity. It's the life that Jesus has with his Father. And that is the life that he is offering to any today who would follow him. What will it mean to become a Christian? Will it wreck your life? No, on the contrary. It will be the beginning of life for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for 
Jesus' manifesto, that he came not to make us religious or to improve the attendance record of the Church of England or anything that we might suspect of him, but he came to give us life abundantly. And thank you, Father, that unlike the politicians or the bankers or the protesters or whoever we're suspicious of in this world, he is prepared to put his life where his mouth is. Thank you, Father, that he chose death instead of life, that we might have life instead of death. And so, Father, we pray that you would help us with that hardest of all things for us, not faith in evidence. The evidence has been very convincing, Father. But we pray you'd help us with the giving up of our own autonomy, instead to enjoy relationship with someone who loves us absolutely and whom we can trust with everything. We pray for Jesus' sake. Amen.